Hi, I'm Charlene Collins Freeman, and welcome to my watercolor tutorial for painting a botanical of a bearded iris. This painting was inspired by a photograph I found on pixabay.com. Pixabay.com is a great resource for artists. Most of the photographs on this website are both copyright free and attribution free. The supplies I use for this painting include Arches Hot Press Watercolor Paper, 140 pound. The size I'm painting on is 14 by 10 inches, 36 by 25 centimeters. I did the drawing with a 2H pencil and a kneaded eraser. My watercolor brushes include a black gold 311 round size triple zero, a Princeton Heritage 4050 round size two, two micro mini brushes, and I cannot recommend these brushes enough. I think they're just fantastic for the small details. I used a pointed round 10 zero and an extra large liner seven zeros. And lastly, I used a tulip angled scrubber brush. You'll need water, water container, and paper towels. All my watercolor paints are Daniel Smith, and the paint colors I use for this particular iris include Hansa Yellow Light, New Gamboche, Yellow Ochre, Alizarin Crimson, French Ultramarine, Rose of Ultramarine, Green Gold, Sap Green, Quinacridone Purple, Quinacridone Rose, and Cobalt Teal Blue. Here's my line drawing. I've darkened it up here for the purpose of it showing up on the video, but be sure to keep your pencil lines light. After I started painting, I realized that I wanted more of the stem to show. The little that shows in the photograph just looks a little bit too awkward in the painting, and I'll show you later how I added that in. So to lighten up my pencil lines, I take a kneaded eraser and roll it across the surface of my paper. This avoids damaging the paper and lifts off just a little bit of graphite. And now we're ready to start painting. Typically, I start my botanicals by painting in all the lightest colors I see. And with this one, I'm making a slight exception. I want to paint in those yellow beards that I see on the iris. Yellow can get polluted very quickly, and I'm concerned that if I wait to paint them in until I've painted in the purple around it, that inevitably I'll end up activating the purple with my brush and dragging some of it into my yellow. So instead, I start right away by putting down this yellow almost at the consistency that I see it in the photo. I'm not even starting with just a light wash of it. My puddle is a milk consistency and it's a mix of Hansa Yellow Light and New Gamboche. I'm already working with a micro mini brush, which usually I reserve for the final details. But this particular iris will present a few exceptions to my usual way of working. And one of those exceptions is in fact, starting off by painting these little detailed beards of the iris. And I'm not just painting the lightest yellows I see, I'm almost painting them as if they're complete. Although I know I will come in later and add a little bit more detail and color to these layers. With yellow, I feel like the more I can get them almost finished before I start adding other colors, the cleaner that yellow area will remain as my painting builds up around it. I also want to point out that I'm playing this video at twice the speed that it actually took me to paint. And I'm pointing that out just to show you just how slowly I was actually making these brush strokes. I was really paying attention to that photograph of looking at the edges and the texture of these yellow beards. Once those are in, I'm ready to go back to what I consider my typical approach to botanicals. And typically, I start off my paintings painting in the lightest lights I see. This is an effort of looking at my reference photo and finding the lightest color I can see throughout the entire flower and painting that in. This wash should have the consistency of weak tea. And I'm really just looking for the basic colors that I see in each area. I will not paint anything in areas where I see super bright highlights. 
and sometimes a flower doesn't have any super bright highlights but with this iris we have quite a few areas that almost appear to be as bright as just the white of the paper so those i will leave untouched because i'm no longer painting details i've put down my detailed brush and i've picked up my black gold 311. it's a bigger brush and I start painting in any areas I see in the flower that have a slightly greenish or bluish tint or cast on them. And to paint this, I have really watery green gold on my palette. Definitely a weak tea consistency. And my eye is scanning the reference photo for any areas that have this sort of green cast to them. I know I'll be coming in and painting more color on top, but if it has this sort of greenish tint, this is the time to start getting it in. I think I've covered the green areas, so I put a touch of quinacridone purple with a lot of water on my palette, and I start painting in the faintest shapes of purple that I see throughout the iris. I know it's tempting to go in darker than this at this stage, but really, if you stick to this plan, you're less likely to make mistakes that will cost you later on in trying to lift and correct. I put down the paint and then, as you see my brush go up towards the top of the palette, I'm really dipping it in water. So I'm even further diluting what I've put down in some areas. I also keep scanning the reference photo and comparing it to my drawing just to make sure that I'm not getting off course. It's easy to start painting and ignoring the lines you put down or not understanding your drawing. If you're at that point, slow down or stop painting altogether and really double check your drawing. These light washes are really laying down the map work for the rest of your painting, so they want to be pretty accurate. That way they'll help you as you proceed through the painting instead of confuse you. I've moved on to a different petal now, and instead of just painting from that same watery puddle of just quinacridone purple, I've added quinacridone rose and a touch of cobalt teal to it. Then I move on to another petal and I see that there's a little bit more yellow. And so you've seen me water down some of that yellow and add that. I wanna be sure I keep the edges of everything I'm painting soft. That's the only way to capture the velvety texture of these petals. We don't want any hard edges at this point. We will later when we come in and do the details, but all this light, painting work should be soft edged. So in addition to really paying attention to my drawing, I am also changing the cast of the hue that I'm painting. In some areas, this really light wash has a more purple hue to it, but in other areas, it might have a little bit more of a pink to it, in which case I add quinacridone rose. In other areas still, I see a greenish yellowy hue. So I water some paint down and add that. And now I come in with just water on my brush to really soften up the edges of everything I've painted on this petal. This petal has a lot of white on it. And I want to be sure I don't paint too much color into it because that white will provide a real glowy contrast with the rest of the paint we put down as we build up our iris. I'll work my way around the entire flower, putting down this initial lightest wash everywhere. I pay careful attention to keep changing the tone of this purple wash, adding more quinacridone purple or more quinacridone rose or sometimes French ultramarine to match the color shift I see on the different petals. If the different colors start blending too much on the paper or they go down too dark, I just dab at them gently with my paper towel or my t-shirt in my case. 
This helps stop the paint from traveling. As I turn my paper around to better suit my wrist as I paint, I also turn my reference photo around so that I can easily identify which area I'm painting and what color cast I need to make. For example, on this outer edge of this petal, I see a more heavily pinkish cast. So you can see from the petal on my palette that I've added quite a bit of quinacridone rose. As I add the different colors, I'm reminding myself to also keep adding water so that I keep this fairly faint in color. This is still that stage one where we're just painting the lightest lights we see. Because I don't paint in strict phases, stage one, stage two, etc., there's often a lot of overlap. So I will also start painting the stage two where I paint just slightly darker lights. On the value scale, they're just one notch darker than these lightest areas I'm putting down now. It helps us start identifying the highlights and separating them from the next lightest shapes. So here I pick up more paint and it's slightly darker than these light tones I've started putting down. In a sense, I'm doing stage one and stage two in the same go round, identifying the lightest highlights and then the next lightest highlights next to that. Usually it's not as easy to identify as it is in this particular flower, but in this flower, we have those lower three petals that are quite light. So those really are stage one, but the three upper petals are slightly darker, even in their lightest areas. So I would say in these upper petals, we're doing stage one and stage two, both at the, this beginning phase. Notice the various puddles I have started here. I have one that's very purple, another one that's very pink, and now I'm mixing some yellow into a purple puddle. I'm getting also the cobalt teal blue, mixing in a little bit of French ultramarine. I keep mixing various puddles until I'm happy with what I see to paint whichever shape I'm focused on next. By starting to identify all the different colors at this stage, I'll make all the subsequent stages much easier on myself. For example, in this area that I'm painting now, the purple has a much more bluish cast to it than that outer edge of the petal that I painted earlier, which is a lot of pink. As I paint that back petal that's just sort of poking through the two side petals, I'm careful to watch the shape of the style arms and the anthers inside. So you see me painting negatively, leaving the white shape of those with their jagged edges.
When we look at the anatomy of the iris, the three petals that are standing up are called the standards. Then we have our yellow beards, and the three petals that are facing downward are called the falls. In the center of the iris, we have the style crest, which looks like petals. We have the stigma and we have the stamen. You don't have to know all these anatomical aspects of your subject, but it really helps you draw and paint more accurately when you know what you're looking at. At this point, you can see how my mixes have definitely gotten darker and how I'm combining stage one and stage two of my process. However, even these darker areas that I've started painting are quite light compared to how I will build up the color when you compare these areas to the reference photo. You can see that I am still painting quite light. As I paint the style crest, those two little parts of the center of the blossom that look like petals, you can see I've painted first with a watery yellow mix, and then I just touch in lightly with more of a quinacridone rose purpley mix. As I paint these areas, I'm careful to paint around both the stigma and the stamen. Dropping that quinacridone rose into the yellow like this is wet into wet. I didn't wet the paper with just water first. I wetted it with yellow mix and then I added the quinacridone rose. I really enjoy this initial stage of these botanicals when I'm painting so lightly that if I'm slightly off, I know I can easily correct the color with another layer once this layer has dried. What I find so enjoyable about this stage is that it seems relatively carefree and I'm really exploring color shifts and the shapes of what I've drawn. Take your time in this stage, really paying attention to the colors you're putting down and the shapes you're identifying. As more and more of my shapes get painted in, it all starts to make more sense to me, all the drawing that I did earlier and I can easily identify what I'm painting. And by being able to easily identify it, I can more accurately come in and make those color shifts. Sometimes I'll mix the color I want on my palette, but sometimes once it's on the paper, I like to add a little bit of color to it like I'm doing here, adding a bit of blue to this purple shape to create a soft wet into wet effect. I also still use my towel to soak up any color that I want to create a lighter highlight. By using the towel when the shape is still wet, I can get really soft edges on any areas I lift out for highlights. And while I want soft effects in some areas, in other areas I want hard edges. So for example, between one petal and the next, I want a hard edge. That way all my purples aren't just blurring together, but I'm getting distinct shapes. That's why you see me sort of hopping around as I paint this. I'm not necessarily painting shapes one next to the other, but rather I paint a shape, let it dry, and then go find another shape that's not touching up against it to paint. That way all these areas have a chance to dry and get hard edges around the petal.
for instance here this darker petal that I'm painting now is up against a lighter petal but that light petal is completely dry so none of this paint will bleed into it and I won't lose the hard edges between the bottom petal and the top petal In our reference photo, all the negative shapes are green. Those are the shapes that are around and inside the petals and the iris. Be sure you don't get confused and paint those purple. In our painting, all of those green shapes will be white since we're not painting a background. Traditional botanical watercolors do not have backgrounds. Once you start doing a painting that is completely covered with a background, then you're painting more along the lines of a floral painting, even if it is anatomically correct and realistic. In the tradition of botanical art, we are not painting backgrounds. We're leaving the background as the white of the paper. So be sure that as you paint in all your petals, you don't mistake a shape that should be the white of the paper as another petal and paint it. For example, look at this beautiful negative shape, which is the white of the paper on my painting and is green in the reference photo that is in the middle of all these petals I've painted. That negative shape helps us really understand the shape of the petals we are painting. So be sure you don't lose your negative shapes. With very watery green gold, I create the lightest tones I see in the stem. And at this point, I have the lightest tones everywhere on the flower and stem. And on the upper three petals, the standards, I also have the next level of lights in. But I need to add those to the three lower petals, the falls. With fairly watery mix of quinacridone rose and quinacridone purple, I'm painting in the next level of lights on these very light petals. This will help me identify the lightest parts of these petals. Then we will be done with stage one and stage two. While these stages help us identify the lightest parts of our subject, stage three will be when we start to identify all the darkest parts of our subject. As always, as I paint these in, I'm paying attention to if the edges should be hard or soft. And that comes from observing the reference photo and really paying attention to where we have those edges. For example, along the edge of this petal, that's a hard edge, but I want it to be soft. So I come in with a slightly damp brush and soften the paint I've already put in. The center of this petal is quite white, but it's dark compared to the petal that is in the very center of our picture. So you can see I've made it already slightly darker. I start to identify some of the darker shapes that I see on the last petal on the right hand side. Although some of these shapes will eventually be much, much darker, I'm keeping them very light at this stage. With those middle tones in on that left hand bottom petal, I can see that that light green I painted in initially can get a little bit darker. And in fact, this area has more of a gray cast with a little bit of green in it. So I brush in some of the purple that I mixed with ultramarine blue and cobalt teal. This is still very watery. I'm still only identifying the lightest lights and the next value. 
still very light. In the next video, we'll start off with stage three, painting in the darkest values. And we will continue on to stage four, which is when we start observing and painting in all the midtones and adjusting our contrast. I've been painting for about an hour, and this is where I'm at now with the lightest lights and the next to lightest lights in. It's time to take a break and come back tomorrow with fresh eyes to paint in the darkest darks and the midtones. See you soon.